I got my first uh, email account on the ARPANET in 1972 and have had continuous email connectivity since then. Uh, in, 19s, uh, in the mid-1980s, mid uh, opened up the, uh, it, the ARPANET and then later on the, uh, the uh, TCP IP networks to the Harvard campus. I work at Harvard University. Put in Harvard, the, the Harvard campus network in that time frame. I uh, was the head of the technical committee of, for Harvard's network, for a regional network in the New England area, and for the, uh, re the National, National Science Foundation Associated Regional Networks around the country uh, in the mid-90s. And then uh, joined the Internet Engineering Task Force in 1990, uh, was appointed chair of the uh, area director for uh, operational requirements area in 1993, I uh, was uh, stayed on that role for f two years, then was uh, for four years, and then was appointed uh, the area director for the transport area, and was stayed in that role for six years. So I was on the IESG, the standards approval body for the IATF, from 1993 to, to 2003. Somebody asked me a few years ago, what was the biggest surprise? Um, I was being involved in the internet from the very beginning. The, the real internet started in J January 1st, uh, 1983, when the TCP IP protocols were uh, put out. And the web started in 93. So back in the late 80s, in the middle 80s, uh, I was using the net daily, all the time. It was magic. You just did, ma you did magic things and magic things happened. Email was all text-based. The biggest surprise I've ever had about the internet is that my mom surfed. It never occurred to me in the, in the early 80s that my mother would ever knowingly use the internet. It was a toy, it was a geek thing, it was for scientists, it was for researchers, it was for technical people. Uh, she, I expected her to use it without knowing it because I expected to be an underlayment for a lot of telecommunications, but I didn't expect her to use it. The web changed all of that. The web made it so that normal people could use this thing. Uh, and that was my biggest surprise. That was, that was the sort of the eureka moment when mom said, I want to do this. Like the weather over any continent, it varies. There are thunderstorms in places and there's um, cool weather in others and there's uh, significant turbulation in other places. So uh, the weather over the United States in the last six months has been tremendously variable. The hottest, uh, one of the hottest summers on record in the Boston area, which is where I live, uh, follow, following a very cold winter, a lot of snow, a lot of rain, very, very heavy rain this, this spring. And that's pretty much the way I think of what's going on in the net. We have uh, very turbulent weather when it comes to governments being scared of the net, uh, the Arab Spring kind of thing. And we have smooth sailing when it comes to technology. The technology is going very well. Uh, we have things like Skype and the like, which are um, incredibly powerful, very game-changing technologies, uh, Netflix, and all of those things that are running over it. Those are great. They're, those are about as sunny as you can get, sunny and clear as you can get. Of course, if your business is being disrupted by the same technologies, you don't think it's sunny. Uh, I think there's a number of possibilities. Uh, the the a, a, one of the possibilities is that this becomes a Disney control TiVo, that the, that the content uh, carrier, the content uh, providers are right, that all we want to do is to watch couch potatoes watching movies. I don't think that's likely, but that's certainly one scenario, and the copyright industry wants the internet designed in such a way that it facilitate that. Another scenario is uh, all government control. Uh, like in China, where you, you, you have to register to use it, you have to have basically a driver's license to use it, and you can't talk outside of the country without being filtered, can't even talk inside the country without being filtered. That's not just China, there's many countries like that. The ultimate one, the IETF model, would be the end-to-end -end model, 
which is where I get to decide what applications I'm going to run, and I talk to you about what applications we're going to work together on. New, dr dramatic new developments in technology and, uh, and services and games or whatever. Uh, and those are the primary three applicants. I guess the fourth one is it's um, completely run by carriers, where the telephone companies and the cable companies decide for you what you need in, in, without, af without bothering to ask you. So it's uh, some very negative views, which is all, all but one of those is very negative. The, the very positive, the uh, Pollyannish one, is the end-to-end -end model of the internet of the IETF. It's mostly education of governments. Uh, the internet has brought phenomenal economic health to the countries that have embraced it, and but uh, has also brought huge social change to others that have embraced it. And, and t t telling, telling countries that they benefit more than they are hurt by it, educating them why that's the case, educating them that the open internet, the open standards process, the open development is beneficial to them and their, and their citizens is the primary vehicle to try and get a positive result.